We're looking at the book of Kings, and uh, this is an important book in the Bible and in the story of the Bible because obviously the Bible is about a kingdom. Jesus, when he went around preaching the gospel, preached the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God, and that was his summary, really, of the biblical story. The Bible is about God establishing a kingdom, but what does that mean? What does that word even <laughs> represent? And to answer that question, God's given us the Old Testament. The Old Testament gives us a picture of the kingdom, and we know that God's goal is for his people to experience his presence in a perfect place forever. And really what God is going to do is glorify himself by triumphing over evil and reversing the curse and making everything new and beautiful and better than it even was in the Garden of Eden. And yet, as we think about that, we might be tempted to ask ourselves, is that even really possible? Can God do that? Certainly we can't do that. It's proven that we can't fix fully fix the problems that our sin created, but can God do that? And in the book of Kings, one of the things that makes the book of Kings so exciting is that we get a preview to that question, an answer to that question, and in in, in kind of a preview of how God can do that. God can do that, and we see that in the first 11 chapters with the reign of Solomon, and this is a definite high point in the history of Israel to this point. And honestly, we said we we just wish we could hit the pause button on what God says after Solomon, or what the writer says after Solomon finishes celebrating the construction of the temple and, and God's coming to dwell in the temple. It says, so Solomon held the feast at that time and all Israel with him before the Lord our God seven days on the eighth day, he sent the people away and they blessed the king and went to their homes joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had shown to David, his servant, and to Israel, his people. That's how chapter 8 ends. And chapter 9 begins with God appearing to Solomon and saying, you know what? Things can stay this way. Things can stay this way. And listen to what God says in verses 4 and 5 have to happen if things are going to stay this way. And as for you... If you will walk before me as David, your father, walked with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I've commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David, your father, saying, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. That's the promise. And yet, of course, we know a Solomon's not going to be able to do that. And that's the problem. And here's the warning. Listen to what God says in verses 6 through 9 will happen if they disobey. But if you turn aside from following me, you or your children, and do not keep my commandments and my statutes that I've set before you, but go and after other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land that I've given them, and the house that I've consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight, and Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And in many ways, this is actually the pivotal section of the entire book. This book is pleading with God's people to worship God alone and to flee from idols. And it does so by first presenting this beautiful picture of what happens when God's people obey him. And then this section concludes with a summary of some of the ways Israel was blessed as Solomon continued to be faithful to God. Specifically, we get a short summary of some of the different things that happened as Solomon served God as king in chapter 9 verses 10 through 28 and then we see how God uses Solomon's wise rule to serve as a light to the nations at the beginning of chapter 10. Now when the queen of Sheba which was most likely located in Yemen about a thousand miles south of Israel she heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord and she came up to test him with hard questions and when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, I love this line, there was no more breath in her. And she offers testimony up about Solomon's rule and wisdom. And this testimony reminds us that one of the, way God, one of the ways God blesses his people through godly, is through godly rulers. 
And I think in many ways it points to a hope much bigger than Solomon as we long for the day when God establishes the one and true faithful king, Jesus, over his people. And so she exclaims in verse 8, Happy are your men. And that word happy is really the word blessed. Blessed are your men. Blessed are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who's delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, he has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. And in case there's any question of how thoroughly God kept his promise when Solomon was committed to worshiping him, we read one final summary of God's goodness to Solomon in chapter 10, verses 14 through 29. Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom, and the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his mind. Every one of them brought his present articles of silver and gold, garments, myrrh, spices, horses, and mule. Mules so much year by year. The world is bringing presents to Solomon. And what a preview. And remember, it's just a preview of how sweet it's going to be for us as believers when God finally sets up and visibly exalts Jesus as king over all the universe. While it's true, he's ruling now. We don't see that as clearly as we would like. But there's a day coming when Jesus will be revealed from heaven and he will establish his rule once and for all. And on that day, even the great prosperity and joy that Israel experienced under the rule of Solomon will pale in comparison to what we will experience as believers under the rule of King Jesus. And yet, in spite of all these great blessings that could only come from God's hand and because of God's grace, Solomon turns his back on God in chapter 11. And of course, that's the problem. That's part of why we need Jesus. And the kingdom takes a big fall, ending up being divided into two. And this chapter, chapter 11, is really like a smack in the face. It's like we're watching a beautiful glass vase drop to the floor. And in the chapters that follow, the writer begins looking at some of the individual broken pieces of the glass one by one. After 10 chapters of absolute buildup, everything comes to a screeching halt in chapter 11. And in verses 1 through 8 of chapter 11, the writer pinpoints the root of Solomon's failure. What did Solomon get wrong according to verses 1 and 2? Listen to it. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your hearts after God, other gods. Solomon clung to these in love. And here he's emphasizing the fact that Solomon loved these women, but certainly also at the same time, one of the reasons why Solomon did this was political. And instead of trusting God, he was making alliances with the nations around them by marrying the king's daughters. And Solomon, that's not, that might be how it works in a monarchy, but that's not how it's designed to work in a theocracy where God rules. God's king will experience victory, not through his own political savvy, but through obedience to God's word. And what we see happens to Solomon is exactly what God warned would happen if someone refused to obey his word. In verses 4 and 5 we read, For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. And this kind of apostasy is absolutely heartbreaking and it is a serious warning to us. It all started back, you remember, in chapter 3 with what looked like a, a small little compromise that made political sense. And yet, he compromised, and as a result, he slowly but surely drifted away from his first love. And this process of turning away from God took years and years to reach this point. How sad, right? This man who was described at the beginning of his rule as loving God is now described as loving foreign women and worshiping their gods. And what is even more sad is that this happened when he was old. For when Solomon was old, 
When you're old, you want to be more passionate and more effective than when you're young. And yet the opposite was true for Solomon. Watch out for compromises and keep pursuing God, refusing to simply rely on past successes. And Solomon's rebellion had consequences, not just for him, but for the entire nation. In verses 9 through 13, we see God explain what would happen as a result. Since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. And yet in the middle of this judgment, God once again shows mercy for the sake of David. And we're going to see that's a key. God keeps his promises. The hope is not in the men. The hope is in God and his faithfulness to his word. And so God tells Solomon, I will give you one tribe, I will give one tribe specifically to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I've chosen. And God then begins the process of punishing Solomon by raising up adversaries against him in verses 14 through 43. First, there's Hadad, the Edomite, and uh, the writer tells the story of Hadad. He escapes from David. He flees with his family to Egypt when he's a little child. He finds favor in the sight of Pharaoh. He marries one of Pharaoh's relatives, uh, the sister of Pharaoh's own wife, actually. And it's likely that this is the same Pharaoh who had given his daughter in marriage to Solomon, actually. So this marriage alliance, which was probably done in those days for the purpose of security, Solomon had married Pharaoh's daughter for the purpose of security, but it didn't work because his enemy, what he did, was just marry another one of Pharaoh's daughters. And then there's Rezon, and we read about Rezon, and then finally there's Jeroboam. And Jeroboam actually started out as a servant of Solomon, but then he met a prophet named Ahijah. And on meeting Jeroboam, this prophet took a new garment and he tore it into 12 pieces, and he prophesied that Jeroboam would be given... 12 tribe, 10 tribes by God as a judgment on Solomon because they've forsaken me and worshiped Asterisk, the goddess of the Sidonians. And God makes a, a promise to Jeroboam that if he would just listen to God's commands and obey him like David did, God would build him the kind of house that he had built David. And instead of repenting when he hears this, Solomon attempts to kill Jeroboam, but of course he's unable to because no man can thwart the great sovereign plan of God and Honestly, reading 1 Kings so far, we can't help but be discouraged by man's continued hard-hearted rebellion against God. In spite of God's revealing himself, in spite of God making great promises, in spite of God fulfilling those promises, in spite of God's grace and goodness to his people over hundreds and hundreds of years, every time, absolutely every time, man has an opportunity to turn away from God it seems like he's seizing that opportunity with all of his might. And yet at the same time, we're also encouraged by the fact that even in the middle of all this rebellion and sin, God is still sovereign. God is still working out his great plan. And there's no one and nothing that can stop God from doing what he wants to do. And the next chapter is an illustration of God's sovereignty even over man's stupidity. Because Solomon's son, Rehoboam, is anointed king over Israel. And Jeroboam comes back to Israel and before Rehoboam represents the people of Israel, uh, Jeroboam actually comes back to Israel and he comes before Rehoboam and he represents the people of Israel to Rehoboam and he does so complaining about the way that Solomon, Solomon had treated them and asking Rehoboam to lighten their load. And uh, Rehoboam, he goes to the old men and he asks for their advice. You know the story. They tell him to be a wise servant and uh, speak good words to them. But he doesn't like their counsel. And instead he listens to the counsel of the young men who he had grown up with. And they tell him to speak to the people and to really speak down to them and say, my little finger is thicker than my uh, father's thighs. And now whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to the yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. And this is just like absolute stupidity. And we might talk for a long time about what was so foolish about it, but the point of the story is not why this was a foolish decision, but instead the point is found in verse 15. What does verse 15 say happened and why did it happen? Listen to this. So the king did not listen to the people for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. If there's one person we might think is beyond God's control, it's a powerful, wicked 
king. And here, as we look at Rehoboam, he's making his own decision. He's exerting his own power. He thinks he's doing this, and he is, and he's making an absolutely stupid decision. And yet the writer tells us, ultimately, the reason he made such a foolish decision was because God was going to keep his word. God is always faithful to his word. And the people respond how you'd expect them to respond. In verses 16 through 24, they rebel against Rehoboam. And if you look at it, this rebellion is quite sad because they're not just rebelling against Rehoboam, they're rebelling against God. They say, what portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. If they knew the promises God had made to David, they should have desperately wanted a portion of David. This is the hope. But they allowed their difficult circumstances to cause them to forget God's promises and turn their back, really, on their only hope. As he sees Israel rebelling against the house of David, Rehoboam decides that he needs to go to battle in order to get those tribes back. But just as he's about to do so, God sends a prophet to him, and the prophet tells him not to war against Israel, for this thing is from me. And amazingly, he listens. He submits to God's word. So they listened to the word of the Lord and went home again according to the word of the Lord, which, of course, is the exact appropriate response. And we're going to see that's the key to stability throughout the rest of this book. And yet it's surprising to see Rehoboam respond like this. And it reminds us that people are complicated and they sometimes make decisions that cause us to want to write them off and give up on them, but sometimes even after people have made shockingly poor decisions, their heart turns to hear God's word. And while this doesn't always erase the consequences of their previous poor decisions, it does show at least a measure of wisdom to submit to God's word before it's too late. It's hard to believe though that one of the first, first things that Jeroboam does after God fulfills his promises and gives him 10 tribes of Israel to govern is turn his back on the God who made that promise to him in verses 25 through 33. And this is a key question. It leads us to a key question in the book of Kings Answers, that the book of Kings is answering, and that is stability. How do you get a stable kingdom? And uh, Jeroboam's answer is idolatry. And we're going to see that is definitely the wrong answer. If you want to establish a kingdom that lasts forever, the answer is not idolatry. Because the temple was in Jerusalem, again, he's going to make what he thinks is a politically savvy move, but it's really stupid. He was afraid that if people went back there to offer their sacrifices, their heart would return to Rehoboam. And there's a measure of common sense in what he's saying, obviously. Uh, And yet, God had spoken to him, and God had told him he would have a kingdom, and he would establish that kingdom if he would just obey his commands. So the decision he makes isn't good strategy. It's actually a lack of faith in God's word, which leads him to idolatry because he doesn't think worshiping God is going to be politically expedient for him. He uses religion to manipulate the people. And he makes two calves of gold. And he says to Israel, Behold your gods, O Israel, who who brought you up out of Egypt. Idolatry and uh, more than one God big problems and he makes a temple and he appoints priests and he sets up a whole other false religion to turn the people's hearts away from the one true God and if you wonder where false religions come from this is just an example it it isn't something sincere there wasn't a pursuit of truth that was taking place here this was about someone who didn't think worshiping the true God would get him what he wanted and so he makes up another religion to exercise power over people instead And even though here the kings are clearly high-handedly ignoring God's word and sinning against God's word, we must not think that God doesn't take their sin seriously. And so in the very next chapter, chapter 13, we see how important it is to submit to what God says. And again, this is a big message of the whole book of Kings. You want stability, you want peace, you want prosperity, do what God says. And so God sends a prophet to Jeroboam, and we're not even told his name. What matters is that he is there to deliver the word of the Lord. It says verse 1, And behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. And he comes to Jeroboam as Jeroboam's in the very act of committing idolatry. And he interrupts the king, which is pretty bold, as he's in the middle of leading this worship service. And he prophesies that God will raise up a descendant of David who will destroy these priests who are leading these people in this idolatry, and he gives a sign that God will do so. And he even tells him it's going to be Josiah, who's going to be a very important man in the book of Kings. But Jeroboam isn't happy 
to hear this, obviously, and so he tries to take charge of the situation. He stretches out his hand, stretches out his hands, and he, got, he orders his guards to seize the prophet, but the moment he stretches out his hand, God somehow cripples that hand, making it useless, and then he miraculously destroys the altar on which he was making sacrifices at the very same time, just the way the prophet had said he would. Obviously, Jeroboam, Jeroboam becomes pretty afraid right now, and so he stops ordering his guards to seize the prophet and instead starts asking the prophet to pray for him, especially that his hand would be restored. The man of God prays, and the king's hand is restored, and the king even goes so far as to ask the prophet to come home and have a meal with him. But the man of God won't go with Jeroboam. Why? What does he say in 1 Kings 13, 8 through 10? This is important. The man of God said to the king, If you give me half your house, I will not go with you. And I will not eat bread or drink water in this place, for so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. In, in the first ten verses, we see God speaking to a king, which is an act of God's mercy. He's coming to this king right in the middle of his sin, identifying his sin and demonstrating the seriousness of his judgment through miracles. And yet ultimately, we'll see that even then, Jeroboam won't repent. Jeroboam may have thought he was too important to have to submit to God's word, but God makes it clear he must submit to his word. And if he doesn't, he will be judged. But it's not just kings who need to submit to God's word. Even prophets need to submit to God's word. And so at first, this prophet seemed to do so, right? He told Jeroboam he couldn't go in with him because he had to obey God. But on the way home, there's another old prophet who hears about what he's done and where he's going. And he comes to him and he tries to get him to turn away from the path God had laid out for him. What does the old prophet do in verse 18? Listen to it. He said to him, I also am a prophet as you are, and an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you into your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. Now, this seems tricky to us, but remember, the man of God, the prophet, clearly knew what God had said. He told you, he wouldn't even, he said, If you give me half the kingdom, I won't go in with you, because I know what God wants me to do. And I say that because when we see what's going to happen, we're going to feel badly for this prophet. But really, God had already spoken to him. God had made it very clear how serious he was about keeping his word. Therefore, he should never have listened to someone, even someone who was religious, who was claiming to speak for God, if they were telling him a message that was different than he had already clearly understood God to have said. And of course, this old prophet is a bad guy, and of course, he deserves judgment as well, but so does the man of God, because he listened to him, and that is the point. What does the old prophet say after the man of God listened to him in verse 21? What's going to happen to him and what is the reason for it? And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the command that the Lord your God commanded you, you will die. He tells him how he will die. And God kept his word exactly. The man of God left from there and on his way home, a lion met him on the road and, and killed him. And we know this was not some random act. Because after killing him, the lion didn't eat him or even his donkey, but just stood beside him until the old prophet came and collected his body and buried him. You can imagine the people who saw this, seeing this lion, kill this man, and then the donkey just stand there. Donkeys don't do that, stand next to a lion, and the lion stand next to the donkey and not eat him. And so God is saying very loudly, this is an act of judgment because this man did not submit to my word. And this story is showing us how seriously God takes obedience to his word. His word will always come to pass, and he demands that we submit ourselves completely to it. We have no excuse for disobedience. We can't even use the excuse that religious leaders spoke for God or claimed to speak for God and lied to us. When this man listened to this old prophet, God judged the man for listening. And you know for sure, if God would judge this prophet for not listening to his word, he would judge Jeroboam and Israel as well. After this thing, verse 33, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but made priests for the high places again from among all the people. Any who would, he ordained to be high priests of the high places. And this thing became sin to the house of Jeroboam, so as to cut it off and destroy it from the face of the earth. Jeroboam thought through idolatry he could make his kingdom stable, and yet it did the exact opposite. He had no hope for a continuing dynasty as a result of his disobedience to God. And 
we see that in the next chapter. Jeroboam doesn't want to submit to God's word, but he still, when his life gets difficult, he wants to go to God for help. And so his son Abijah becomes sick. We see this in chapter 14. And his kingdom, as a result, is unstable. He doesn't have hope of a dynasty. And he sends his wife to the prophet Ahijah to find out what's going to happen with his child. And he's concerned that Ahijah won't tell her what he wants to hear if he recognizes that she's the wife of Jeroboam. So he advises her to disguise herself and to go with presents for him and ask that he would let them know what's going to happen with their child. But obviously disguises won't <laughs> help you stay hidden from God. It actually would have been difficult for Ahijah to recognize her as the wife of Jeroboam apart from the disguise because his eyes were dim because of the age, of his age. And yet God tells Ahijah who's coming and exactly what to say to her. And even before Ahijah sees her, when he heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door, he identifies her, come in, wife of Jeroboam. And God gives Ahijah some tough news to tell her. First, God was going to judge Jeroboam. Jeroboam went to find out about his child, but God first wanted him to know that his descendants were going to be cut off. I will bring harm upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam every male, both bond and free in Israel, and will burn up the house of Jeroboam as a man burns up dung until it's all gone. Why? Because I tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, and yet you have not been like my servant David who kept my commandments, but you have done evil above all who were before you and made for yourself other gods and images provoking me to anger and have cast me behind your back. And this is a really important text. It shows us the way God hates idolatry. And we need help knowing what's wrong, don't we? Idolatry often doesn't seem like that big a sin to us, especially when we compare it to other sins. But God is the one who knows what is right and wrong. He is the one who is right. <laughs> Righteousness is the foundation of his throne. And he can clearly see what is good and what is evil. And we see in the book of Kings how much he hates idolatry. One reason God hates idolatry is because of the unique relationship he has with his people. He's entered into a covenant relationship with them. And the nature of this unique relationship helps us get a sense of just how wicked and terrible and perverse the sin of idolatry really is. Dale Ralph Davies explains, Yahweh has done what no other God had done. He entered into a covenant with his people, a marriage-like relationship, which demands exclusive devotion. When there is a marriage relationship and one of the spouses commits infidelity, the other spouse will be devastated, crushed, and hopefully furious. Why? Because it is the proper character of love within an exclusive relationship to be jealous, to be rightfully possessive of the one who has promised to be totally his or hers. If such an aggrieved spouse reacted with apathy or indifference, we would question if any love were present. Yahweh is the unusual God who has entered into a covenant with a people and no other gods is his primary demand. To violate that is to invite his fury because... God really does love his people. And God will judge Jeroboam's idolatry by tearing the kingdom away from him. And God will judge him by not rescuing his child. And when Jeroboam's wife enters the city, the child was going to die. And there's a sense in which this is the mercy of God, actually. The, the way the future descendants of Jeroboam were going to die was going to be brutal. The author says, Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. And anyone who dies in the open country, the birds of the heaven shall eat, for the Lord has spoken it. But in this particular child, there's found something pleasing to the Lord, the house of Israel and the Lord of Israel. And so he would die a normal death from this sickness and be mourned and buried. But beyond judgment on Jeroboam's house, Ahijah goes on to prophesy that God will judge the nation of Israel by sending them into exile. Again, this is a very important moment in the book of Kings because it was most likely written to a people in exile who would have been looking back to this book to understand why they were in exile. And here we see they were not in exile because of foolish political decisions their kings had made. They were in exile for spiritual reasons. God can establish his kingdom. We saw that. We saw that in Solomon. But the problem, the obstacle to his kingdom is not God's power, it's man's sin. Sin has to be dealt with. And we see in chapter 14, verses 
15 and 16, what God's going to do to Israel and why. The Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water and root up Israel out of this good land that he gave to their fathers and scatter them beyond the Euphrates because they've made Ashram provoking, made their Ashram their God, provoking the Lord to anger. And he will give up Israel because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned and made Israel to sin. So King give us, gives us hope there about the kingdom. There can be this kingdom. God can do it. But it also creates this question in our minds. How will God do it when man is so quick to sin and when there's this problem in the heart of man that so quickly turns away from God to other idols? 